Good afternoon, and welcome to our Facebook Live discussion. I am Dr. Meg Carey, one of the Senior Health Advisors at Oregon Health Authority and a Child and Adolescent Psychiatrist. Today, we will be joined by Dr. Ruth Suniga, a clinical and community psychologist, as well as professor at Pacific University, and also Dr. Robert Niemeyer, also a clinical psychologist and the director of the Portland Institute for Loss and Trauma. We're going to talk about COVID-19 and grief, recognizing that we have all weathered losses, many different types of losses and often intersecting losses this past year. This topic is in the core of our COVID-19 experience. And while today we are turning our attention to grief, we also recognize that the disruptions of COVID have opened conversations and opportunities that will support our healing and our health. We want to start with a pause of recognition to our state's recent milestone. This past, this past Sunday, the 28th, marked the anniversary of, our, of the first known individual in Oregon with COVID-19. This week begins our second year of the pandemic, which has disrupted every aspect of our lives. Here, more than 2,200 Oregonians have died with COVID and more than 150,000 people have had the disease. Across the United States, over a half a million family and community members have died with COVID. We have reached another milestone. More than 1 million COVID-19 vaccine doses have been administered to Oregonians. This is awesome news and it gives us hope, but it does not undo the effects of the past year. The loss of each of our loved ones is painful and the impacts ripple outward. We are also mourning and handling many other kinds of losses. Not being able to be with loved ones in their final moments because of COVID safety precautions, contending with the long-term health effects of COVID illness, struggling with the loss of jobs, lost businesses, milestones, routines, presumed certainties, time, adapting to changes to our plans, the ways that we mourn and the ways that we gather. And we are doing this all while being increasingly fatigued by the pandemic. Each of these types of grief is personally hard, often hurts, and deserves acknowledgement and understanding. Today, we want to take some time to recognize the deep grief and loneliness this pandemic has caused and share some of our ideas for coping and support. Next, I would like to introduce Dr. Robert Niemeyer. Thank you very much for inviting me to the party here and to be a, a voice uh, addressing these very essential uh, humane concerns. As we enter the second year, Meg, of course, we're, we're confronting a kind of shadow pandemic that comes in the wake of the, the viral pandemic, and it is a pandemic of grief. And for that, of course, there is no vaccine. Um, you know, grief is the price we pay for loving, and it's, it's in some sense how we love one another uh, when we when a loved one dies. Uh, but there are many factors, and as we've detected in our research and as we know in our lives and in our hearts, that can make this grief much more com uh, complicated, much more anguishing, um, and potentially more prolonged and debilitating than other forms of grief. And so we've been trying to look at what those factors are and what we might do about them. I'm happy to say a bit more about that, but I'm also happy to pause for others to interject ideas. So, uh, let me go on to say then that uh, as we've, we've, what we've tried to do is develop a kind of psychological or psychiatric screener, five questions basically that help us determine who is really suffering uh, at a point that they're saying, this is impairing me. I'm not able to function as a parent. I'm not able to show up for my partner and my work life is massively disrupted. And we find that people who have this kind of debilitating grief often have a death wish. They wish that they were dead in order to be with their loved one. They, they have a sense that they themselves have, uh, part of them has died along with their loved one. They have a general sense of apathy about life. Nothing really matters anymore. Nothing has meaning. Um, and they may also have difficulty reminiscing about the loved one in a consoling way. They're so overshadowed in a sense with the, the difficult circumstances of the dying. And then we've looked at all those COVID circumstances, just as you mentioned, the inability to be there for the loved one uh, in the final days of life, to being haunted by images of their dying alone, suffering, maybe hooked to some machine, uh, 
the emotional distance imposed by those COVID precautions. And often with reduced communication with the doctors, decades of family oriented care have been rolled back. It's almost like the 1950s again, in some ways for good medical reasons. Uh, but psychologically, it leaves the bereaved feeling even more isolated. And for many, we find that those of a religious orientation may have real questions about the intention of God or the universe uh, in visiting this plague on humanity. So these 10 factors each account for part of the impairment, part of the distress that people report to us when we study hundreds and over 800 people uh, who have lost loved ones uh, to COVID. So that's a little bit of a backdrop for us to consider. Thank you, Dr. Niemeyer, for sharing some of the unique nuances that the grief of this particular pandemic is bringing up for people. I'll turn it over to Dr. Ruth Suniga at this point to share some of your reflections and observations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carey. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, OHA, for the invitation. And thank you to you, the audience, for your interest in this talk. Being today uh, in this panel, it's a little bit sweet, I'm gonna be honest, because on the one hand, it's an honor to have uh, this conversation and to, to be able to be in this panel to discuss um, this important topic. On the other hand, it is a topic that is painful. It is painful um, for many of us. It is uh, painful because of the multiple and difficult um, situations that it is that the uh, losses during the last year have caused to us. And so first, I want to say that my heart goes to all of you who have experienced loss you know, during this last year. <laughs> and I hope that today through our conversation in one way and another, we can provide some kind of support uh, for you and potentially for your loved ones. So it is not a surprise for all of us to recognize that COVID has hugely impacted uh, our communities, but especially communities of color and especially the Latinx community in Oregon. For me as a Latina, that has been a, a painful situation to navigate, I'm gonna be honest uh, as well. And the consequences of the pandemic have brought, as Dr. Kerry was saying earlier, has brought these direct and indirect losses. But additionally, we also have to recognize other losses and other painful situations we have experienced, such as the social injustices and the wildfires during the last year. Many of you may have heard this uh, saying, and um, I have heard it multiple times during the last year, that we all are in this boat together, that we are in this COVID storm together. And whereas I agree with portions of it, uh, because the, yeah, COVID has been a storm that has, affecting, uh, has affected us all, uh, but the storm is affecting us in different ways. And how we survive in that storm is different. Frugally speaking, for some, maybe we are have the privilege to survive that storm in, uh, with loved ones and with the support of other ones, and others may have to survive the this storm on their own while feeling like drowning, especially for those affected uh, by the pandemic. And this is see, so this sense of drowning that may feel like this sense of grief. Uh, can produce a, a senses of feelings, as Dr. Uh, Neumeier was saying, of shock, denial, anger. And what makes grief very complicated is that everybody experiences differently. And healing take loss, uh, take time, and losses, the losses that we experience from the pandemic will take time to heal. But we hope to offer some uh, recommendations to, to cope and to help with in some way grief those losses. And these are some of the things that we usually recommend and I like to recommend uh, the people that I work with and also the people close to me that have experienced losses. And one thing is understand that our emotions, our feelings and our experiences are valid. And that means it's important to honor our emotions. Sometimes it's okay to cry, to feel confused, to feel angry, overwhelmed. But through all of this process, it's important also to find, to be kind and compassionate to ourselves. Uh, other, other recommendation that we usually do is, and, and we have seen, uh, and this usually help the people that we work with, 
is acknowledging the losses and the feelings of the grief and find ways to express that grief, maybe through the arts, maybe through connecting with friends, cooking, praying, different ways that uh, we can actually relieve some of those uh, those feelings, but also, again, uh, uh, express uh, those emotions. We all know that for healing to happen, uh, if we're sick, physically sick, we need to rest. And in the same way, for emotional health, uh, for our emotions to be uh, stronger and for our emotional health, we need to rest as well. So I want to uh, encourage those that um, maybe experience a lot of overwhelmed feelings with uh, during this time to take time to pass and to and to breathe uh, and to and especially at times when we are very overwhelmed we have something with us all the time which is the breath so how, how important is to connect to that breath sometimes the way that it can help us is just when i when we feel overwhelmed just take a breathe big inhalation and then an slow exhalation and sometimes just that brief moment of rest may help us uh, just to deal with the overwhelmed sense uh, of emotions. Another way that we is in, that healing happens is in relationship with community by connecting with others. And so that means maybe finding healing and comfort uh, during this time. It may mean doing a lot of uh, host or hosting conference calls or inviting people to, to be part of the uh, conversations with us through distance. And one thing, one last thing that I want us to remember is the importance of asking for help. Asking for help in Spanish, we say es de valientes, is something for the strong ones. When we can actually recognize that and don't be afraid to ask for help and seek out support either from faith-based organizations or community leaders or friends or people that can be there to listen. And if it's needed, even talking uh, with a professional. Uh, and we also have some resources that we would like to share with you uh, that maybe will be helpful to some of you or your family or loved ones. And therefore, I'm just going to give the microphone, just to call it like that, to uh, Dr. Kerry, who has some uh, information for us. Thank you, Dr. Sunia. And I must say that even your brief reminder of something that I'm also often reminding people of, to rest and take a breath, I notice my own shoulders dropping. And I think about what we can do as friends and colleagues and community to remind each other, have you taken your breath? Have you had your rest? So thank you for that. And indeed, we do have some resources we wanna make sure that everyone on this call knows about. Uh, we have a safestrongoregon.com, our website where there is a plethora of resources ranging from, um, people to talk to right away, to how to connect with therapists and resources and communities, to a community care resource guide that provides an array of connections that was developed um, in collaboration with community members. If you need to talk, please call. As Dr. Suniga and Dr. Niemeyer have shared, we are all feeling and, and healing happens through the sharing of our feelings. The Safe Strong Helpline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It offers free emotional support and referrals to resources for anyone who needs it. Please call 1-800-923-HELP, 1-800-923-4357. And it's not only for those who are experiencing a crisis in the moment, we encourage you to call anytime. If you'd like a peer to talk to, please consider calling the David Rompre Oregon Warm Line. It's available from 9 a.m. to 11 p.m. every day. The telephone number is 1-800-698-2392. Again, 1-800-698-2392. For our elders in our community, we recognize the loneliness that you are experiencing from the COVID uh, visiting restrictions is unique and challenging in very particular ways. There is a statewide senior loneliness line that we also encourage you to reach out to. The telephone number for the statewide senior loneliness, loneliness line is not only a tongue twister, but it's at 503-200-1633, 503-200-1633.
Hi, my name is Sarah Kilber. I'm from the communications team at, at OHA, and we are ready for your questions now. We want to make sure we can get to as many of your questions as possible, so we will only be taking questions on the topic of grief today. First up, we have a question from Patty. Patty writes, it's hard to pretend all is normal and just go to work. Everyday problems are so much harder to deal with and I am so exhausted. Any tips? Would you Patty, like to take okay. that, Ruth? I would take part of it. Uh, Patty, first, um, I'm very sorry that you're going through a difficult time. And, and thanks for sharing and thanks for the vulnerability that you're uh, having to ask this question. And so when you say that it is hard and it's hard to pretend that everything is normal and just go to work, of course it is hard and it will be hard and it sucks. And I think that this is important to recognize. And unfortunately others sometimes don't recognize that and that make a, may be painful, a, but a, the good thing is you're asking for a, some tips and what we can do. I like to say there are five things. I'm just going to give you maybe three recommendations that I uh, usually give for people that are struggling every day. And it's about uh, this. I'm just going to give you three quick tips, not only for you, Patty, maybe for other people. And, and so the tip number one usually is we like to say uh, try to focus in this moment. And the way that we can be focused on this moment is actually by being able to uh, stay, uh, to try to control what you can control and knowing that there are certain, certain situations that you cannot control. So living one moment at a time is one of the recommendations, even when it may be really hard and painful to, to think about how can we actually live one moment at a time in, in, in a difficult time. The uh, tip number two, uh, I like to say two breaths, a two cycles of breath a day are a potent, powerful way to heal. And one of the ways that we, what I mean is there are plenty of research and plenty of evidence that uh, two times, if we practice two times a day, four, four in-breaths, four inhalations and four exhalations, uh, strong and inhalations and very slow exhalations, two, four times, two times a day, that helps uh, with some of those overwhelming emotions. It may not help immediately, but with, within time. And the three thing I like to say is, even at difficult times, counting our blessings are, uh, uh, is one powerful way to deal with the stress, deal with overwhelming emotions. So think about three blessings around you, maybe using your five senses to think about three things or to see three things that you uh, can enjoy tasting three things that you can see around you and or just naming three things during your day that uh, you are you're feeling grateful for this is not going to take the problem or the difficulties away but sometimes what we're looking throughout the day is just moments moments where you are not feeling overwhelmed just moments of resting uh, throughout the day and uh, dr neimeyer maybe you want to add something else to that it's hard to add much to that. You've done such a great job there, Ruth. Uh, I, if I were to say one thing, it's that it's helpful in that moment of stillness that maybe follows uh, that little bit of pause and the breath work that uh, Ruth is talking about, just to ask ourselves maybe with closed eyes, what do I need now most deeply? What do my feelings tell me about what I'm needing more of? And maybe it's contact with others. Maybe it's time simply to relax, maybe it's exercise, uh, maybe it's a particular person, a particular conversation that we yearn for. Um, and then to take a concrete action step to make it so, to find some way concretely in the week to introduce time for that thing um, that can build on the, the very helpful uh, general advice by taking some advice from yourself about what you require and then acting on it. All right, I think we're going to go to our second question. Um, Susan asks, what about Oregonians who can't access therapy because we can't afford it? Dr. Carey, do you want to start? Sure. Thank you, Susan. And thank you for bringing up an issue that uh, we know exists. And the 
demand for therapy, um, even for those who can afford it, is is huge. And, and we don't have a sufficient behavioral health system and workforce. And we also don't have a sufficiently diverse enough behavioral health and health workforce to effectively meet the need right now. That being said, there are a lot of resources out there because of people recognizing this is an issue and this is a need. And I, I encourage you to go to safestrongoregon.org or masfuertesoregon.org and look at some of the resources there. There are resources that are specifically curated for individuals with uh, particular races, ethnicities, other demographics um, that matter in their match of a clinician. There's also other resources outside of our behavioral health system that many people find beneficial, community resources, faith-based resources. And, um, and then lastly, there are also links on that website to uh, the Oregon Health Plan and making sure that you have the level of insurance that you can afford and that you uh, warrant in order to cover these services. Great. Um, for our third question, Virginia asks, what about those of us grieving because our family members died of other rare diseases, but not COVID? I feel like this fixation on COVID invalidates my right to grieve and people expect me to be resilient and strong because other rare diseases aren't COVID. I think that's a profound point. Uh, and the reality is that essentially every death suffered from this time last year has been under the, the, the blanket of, of COVID. Uh, my mother died of COVID-19. I've lost loved ones to cancer, um, uh, to heart failure. These are normative causes of death in some sense but they take place in very non-normative circumstances. All of those COVID risk factors of being unable to be there with our loved one, unable to perhaps organize or participate in an appropriate funeral gathering. We encounter this at a time that most of faith communities are shuttered. Uh, we lack that support. Uh, we had the sense of, as my neighbor said, um, whose husband had a, a severe heart attack and was she rushed him to the hospital. That was the last time she saw him. Uh, because as he lay in cardiac intensive care, and now and then a, a harried nurse would hold the phone to his face. Um, she said, you know, Bob, the words would come through. I could see the image, but the emotions wouldn't come through. So all of those factors are uh, affecting all of us, regardless of the cause of death. And as you say, because the, the headline story every day for a year has been COVID, those other losses can often be marginalized and we have to name and claim our pain, right? but also find ways um, in our own lives and in the bigger world to honor our loved ones, uh, to speak their names, to keep their stories alive, and not to have the unfortunate circumstances of their death overshadow the uniqueness and beauty and love of their life uh, that we want to carry forward in our own. So I think you're exactly right. Um, we are all much more alike than different in this regard, regardless of our cause of loss. Um, our next question is from Tim, who asks, what about the pandemic's effects on children who are anxious, depressed, and exhausted like most of us adults? Ruth, would you like to have a turn with that one? Yeah, I would like to have a little, uh, add a little bit, and but I would like to also invite a Dr. Carey to come in as she's uh, an specialist with children, and, and and so I think that will be important to hear from from you, Dr. Carey, as well. So one of the important things is to recognize that uh, children, especially young children, take a lot of we can call it the energy from their parents. So when we feel exhausted and overwhelmed and the children are gonna be able to notice that. Therefore, uh, before focusing on the children, it's very important that we focus, we as parents focus on ourselves. Therefore, um, self-care as we call it, or some people may call it, you know, skills for, for, being, for resistance or for continue surviving during this difficult time for the parents is very important. So what, in the first recommendation will be, can, what can we do, we as a, as a, as a parent, 
uh, to be able to deal with the difficulties and to be able to engage in practices every day that can help me continue in this marathon of, of the pandemic that many of us are ready to, to say enough and are very tired about it. But what can we do every day um, to take care of ourselves and model that to our children? Because when we model that uh, to our children, we also are giving them a sense that uh, safe and security that they they can feel uh, safe more safe and secure uh, when they see that their parents uh, 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 can uh, uh, that are taking care of themselves as well but again i would like uh, for dr Kerry to add a little bit more if possible thank you so much dr Sinino, for saying exactly where i was going to start too that it's in it's in the family and it's in the community and, um, and there's really good evidence from a diversity of studies over centuries and across the world that how primary caregivers and the adults in our lives handle stress is a really important model um, and a really important teacher to how we as kids uh, handle and process our stress. And as a very imperfect mother of two young children who absolutely are experiencing the rainbow of emotions right now, um, I also recognize the importance of me reaching out to my support networks, my partners, my friends, um, family members who can pinch hit a Zoom call or reading a book over uh, Hangout or FaceTime with my kid while I catch my breath. I also appreciate the times when I can model to our children, I'm overwhelmed, I'm tired, this is the best I can offer you, and this is my plan for how I'm going to relax or how I'm going to process this feeling. Another thing that I wanted to comment on is that in addition to our children feeling anxious, depressed, overwhelmed, confused, scared, there's lots of other feelings that they are experiencing as well. Um, many of our children are feeling excited and nervous about going to school in person again or for the first time. Um, or feeling sad or grateful that their families have decided not to go to school in person and instead are gonna stay home. Many children are thriving right now in ways that they weren't because they're not having to deal with bullying at school in the same way or racism in the same way. And how do we as the adults and caregivers in their lives help them again see the rainbow of emotions that they're feeling. It's very easy for us, I think, to see problems and want to solve them as parents, but it's also important for us to shine a light on the strength, on the thriving, on the resilience that our kids are feeling and reinforce that, and sometimes reminding them of how they're problem solving. The really awesome way that you saw them yesterday handle their frustration or their worry, and reinforcing and highlighting the skills they have to do that can feel empowering in a time when we all feel incompetent um, and can feel reassuring. And it's also a way for us to notice and connect with them. There is a mantra I try to follow that feelings are an opportunity for connection. Feelings are a way of communicating where we're at. And as we use those feelings, and I cannot deny that sometimes when our three-year-old is having a particularly hard feeling, sometimes it's hard for me to remember to connect. But when I can get myself into the mind space of our kid is trying to tell me something, how do I listen? It can also help us reflect on our own feelings and where we're at. So thank you for the question, Kim. Uh, I think we have time for one more question or perhaps, uh, are we, we may be out of time. I oh, know, sorry, we do have time for one more question. <laughs> we are running against the clock here. Uh, Jillian asks about the mental health of owners and workers who are dealing with struggling businesses. It's a wonderful question. It probably doesn't admit of a, a very brief answer, but I think uh, a beginning of an answer is to recognize that we are quite capable of experiencing grief about non-death losses. And certainly, uh, if we think about what we spend our time doing, we probably spend more time working than we do doing anything else. And so it's very relevant to our sense of identity, purpose, uh, our sense of meaning in life. Um, so to find ways of restoring that meaning, of finding alternative sources, and also, of course, to creatively adapt to the changing circumstances of work becomes critically important. Uh, I suspect that could be a program all on its own. I would like to extend a thank you to 
Doctors Suniga and Dr. Niemeyer for joining us in this conversation today. Really appreciate you sharing your. Episode. It's a pleasure. Thank you.